Hello, and welcome to the Moms Who Know podcast. I'm your host, Chanel Nielsen, and I'm joined today by Ashley Burke. Ashley, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on today. I heard about Ashley's story years ago when it happened. It was in the news, and I'm going to let her tell you her story um, because she knows all the details, and I'd rather you hear it from her. But what I wanted to say in introduction here, why I think it's so interesting to have Ashley on the show is that we get these tidbits of people's lives from the news. And when you hear her story, it might sound familiar to you. Um, You may have heard it like I did on the news, but we don't get the after. We don't get to hear what happened after and how it actually affected the lives involved. And so I'm grateful to be able to have this chance to talk to you, Ashley, and really hear about how this story, your story affected you personally and how you've learned and grown from it. So to start off, why don't you go ahead and tell us um, the story and kind of what happened and your, your whole backstory here? Okay. Well, I'm I'm usually long winded, so I'm gonna make this this the short version. Um, okay. Basically, when I was 28 years old, I had just given birth to my fifth child. Um, on a night in March, it was March 11th, 2011. I received a knock at the door, and I learned a whole bunch of truths about a life I didn't know my husband was having, and he was having an affair with a paralegal that worked for us and her husband had come to the Walgreens near our house and um, he shot and killed him. He shot him once in the forehead, once in the heart, and he died instantly in that parking lot. Um, So it was kind of a whirlwind of, that was kind of like the moment of impact, I guess you could say. Um, But I would say my real journey has been since sitting on that couch with the detectives that night, trying to figure out who I was supposed to be through humiliation of knowing that my husband wasn't fighting for me as he died. He was fighting for another woman who he was putting over our marriage um, and trying to figure out who I was. I, I just became like the shell of a person. So my real journey I like to share the most is figuring out how to be me again. And not only, um, well, I guess for me, I feel like I kind of got thrown into this title of victim, but trying to figure out how to get out of that victim mentality and the actual, the actual victim that I was of a murder and of infidelity. So that's kind of okay. Yeah. Okay. So I love, I love that whole idea that you have worked really hard to get out of that whole victim mentality. Um, now you said your youngest was two months and your oldest was how old? Uh, my twins were in kindergarten. They were going to be six in April. Okay. So very young family, just to paint the picture for us a little bit more. How, I mean, how were you feeling in your marriage? Were you completely blindsided by this? I imagine. I mean, when you have just been pregnant and had a baby, things are always crazy anyway. So, right. You know, I had, I had suspicion of something being wrong, but I never in a million years thought it would be that. Like, it just was something that I'm like, no, that there's no way. And I'd find, I'd try to find evidence of what was going wrong, but never had anything tangible until I had all the information at once. Wow. So had you guys talked about it, like said to your husband, you know, something's not feeling right or had these kind of conversations? Yeah. You know, that night I had like, let's see, we'd had lots of conversations. I'd had really bad dreams that my baby died and like all these weird things happening. And I would like search the garbage and try to find evidence of what was wrong. And I really just thought I was going crazy, like postpartum or something, which I had never had with the other four pregnancies or for kids. Um, and so that night actually, before he left, I said, you know, I, I feel like something's wrong and I just want you to know, like I'm here, whatever it is, if it's something with you, but I, we've got to figure it out. Like I'm literally losing my mind and he didn't, he just told me I was crazy and 
So it was definitely a wow. rocky spot. You know, I we had a pretty pretty steady marriage that I thought um, up until that point. So it was definitely a rocky spot that I had a lot of unknowns, but mainly I felt like I was just very unstable from a pregnancy and all that stuff. So. Yeah. Okay. And, and everyone does. I mean, I'm this, I also am a mother of five and there's just, you know, a lot of hormones and a lot of things and everything always there's always an adjustment after each baby it's been for me where things, you know, don't feel the same and you're getting used to a new normal with your marriage, with everything. So I can imagine it would be easy to think, you know, oh, it's just me and, you know, something. Yeah. It's going to level out. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so then, and then no, it, you don't have time for anything to level out and totally. Yeah. Totally blindsided by that. Um, Okay, so this brings up a a huge issue because the people who I have known who have dealt with infidelity and who have afterwards, you know, tried to rebuild their marriage and make it work. It's a process, this whole forgiveness process and working through and talking about it. and, And it comes up over and over again and all these things obviously you didn't get that chance. You didn't get that chance to, you know, work things out. And so how have you dealt with this fact? How has it been different dealing with it after your husband was killed? What is that like for you? Um, For a long time, it was just really lonely. Like I have three people in my story and I had always seen forgiveness as like, okay, I'm sorry, me too. Let's be friends. And And these three people, one was gone, my husband, and two, I really didn't know them and nor do I know if they, they, they worried about how it felt for me, you know? So I, um, I've definitely seen forgiveness in a new light. And with that, it's been a daily battle that I get to win by myself with my God, my creator. And so it's be, it's, it's redefined forgiveness, which has been a really healthy thing for me because it's not about the other person. I, um, I had a, a lady once tell me a quote by Lewis Smeads, and she said, he said, um, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and realize that the prisoner was you. Oh, and that like good. sunk in, I'm going to say it again, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and realize that the prisoner was you. And for me, I actually have a prisoner in my story who I've had to, I've had to fight to forgive the gun, the other woman, and this husband who was now gone. Um, But realizing that I was the one in chains has been the most freeing, like the anger was killing me. It wasn't hurting anybody else. It was hurting me. So letting go of that daily as it comes up and as it comes up in my children working through it each time I feel a little bit stronger and a little closer to my own strength and to the strength of things way greater than me. That's so good. So tell us how you do it because I mean, all of us are dealing with some, someone, some situation, something that we have to forgive that's most likely much less, you know, much more minor of a thing than that. And so when we hear this, it's like, well, why can't I let go of that other thing? And how, how do I let go? So do you have any, any ways that you've done it? You talked about turning to God, but how, how does that look? Like, how do you do it? Oh, it's like a hard thing to put into words because I tried counseling and hashing it over and being angry. I tried, um, I, I seriously feel like I've tried everything, but the times that I've really felt the forgiveness have been really in unexpected moments. Um, Sitting in a murder trial for a month and and expecting this healing moment to come, like this profound, everybody's going to care, you know, and it didn't. And then as as the verdict was announced, I like, it was like time froze because I really thought that I was going to have like this light shine through me and I was going to have the beauty and the beast rooftop. Everything is better. It's over. He's going to jail. And I didn't. For the first time in a year and a half, I looked around a room and saw other people. 
I saw two moms. I saw a mom on his side of the courtroom bursting into tears because her son was going to jail. And I saw a mom on my side of the courtroom, my, my husband's mom, and she was broken. Nobody won. And like the mm. empathy that came was part of my healing. Like, wow, there's other people who are hurting. And I shoved that back down because I'm like, wow, I don't know how to do that. And then I was given an opportunity a few days later at a grocery store. I felt prompted to give a lady a hundred dollar bill. And in that moment, I felt forgiveness, not because anybody came to complete me, but because I felt like my heavenly father was asking me to be something more for him. And that, I don't know how that is forgiveness, but it was, it's just like, he's given me these ever since, you know, the night my husband was killed is the day I realized that there's angels on earth, like real, it's real. At least for me, I've seen so many miracles. And so utilizing their power, asking, asking my creator to send them to help me heal on those days when I wake up with a bad dream or some piece of evidence a lot of times that was just slapped in my face. And, and knowing that I can't control everything, I can't control what's going to happen. I can't control what did happen, but he has the power and I call it grace um, to help us heal. Even if we're not the ones being asking for forgiveness, but we're asking for just healing in our story, being okay with who we are and finding our worth. Wow. That is so powerful. And I think that one thing as you were talking and you said, it's hard to put into words to describe the process, but I think you, you did a beautiful job of describing what that really looked like. The forgiveness really was able to come for you when you looked outward. And I think that that's huge because it's like with happiness. I was just reading an article about happiness and it talked about the more we try to get happiness in our hands, the more it slips away from us. Uh, this is a mm. quote that I'm, I don't know the exact verbiage, but it says something like that. But if you kind of look, do something else, it comes and lands like a butterfly on your shoulder. And that's nice. kind of what I'm hearing about forgiveness, which, you know, as you looked around and saw those other people and felt a little bit of what they were feeling, then you were able to let go a little of that hurt and to have a little bit of forgiveness. So that is just a great principle there that I think we can all learn from. Definitely not a check that you make like, okay, I forgave you. It's a process yeah. and it's okay if sometimes it feels like you're going a little backwards. Hmm. That's good too. That's important because yeah, it's not a linear process there. And mm -hmm. I imagine, especially for you, it wasn't where you're dealing with all this grief and all this betrayal and just so many things all at once. Um, which brings me to the, the next thing I would really like to talk about how you overcame. You have a, a blog called the moments we stand. I love the name of that because I love the the point that you've brought out already that this caused you to to stand up to be more to realize who you are and and understand yourself better. Um talk to us about how even though you were thrust into this victim uh spot that you don't consider yourself a victim anymore. I think the first um be, given being given the opportunity some some thought that came to my mind that I was supposed to write this blog. It was really inspiration because it wasn't something I was going to be okay with. Um, but as I started to write, I pictured when I got this inspiration that I was going to be like, okay, this person sucks. This person sucks. This is why my life sucks. <laughs> right. And I hope, like, I hoped that I was ready for that opportunity to just let it all out, all the hate and fear. And uh, but then as I started writing. Um, I was, I was blessed to remember all of those miracles that I just talked about the little, the little bright rays of light in the day that got me through. And there was always something. And I had written some of them in a journal and luckily I had kept that. And, um, so those really were the first step, I think, to say, you know what, I'm going to be better. I'm going to, but looking back, I didn't feel strong. So it's been, it's been cool to look back and see that I had strength, even though I felt so weak. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, that does. So tell us a little about that, about some of the miracles that you've seen along the way. Oh man, it was, it was just little things. Um, when you're in such a dark place, 
that's where I think the victim mentality is easy. You know, that little voice in your head that's like, dude, you're such a loser. And let me tell you why. Let me show you all the evidence of why. Um, that battle, I felt like I was always raging inside my mind. Like the moment, the moment everything happened, I was like opened up to these fears of who I thought people thought I was and who I truly believed I was. Um, but there was always some light in my day, whether it was a song on um, my baby's, I always played songs in my baby's room and a day when I had to go spend with the detectives and I was so stuck in that fog and I couldn't feel like I couldn't see my kids. I couldn't, I couldn't feel good. I couldn't even feel, I couldn't feel anything but evil. I was just so hurt and scared and humiliated. And I walked into my baby's room to pick him up and this song came on the footprints in the sand song. And it was like this powerful, but most silent voice was saying, Hey, I gotcha. I'm going to carry you through this. And it was just so many moments like that, that I just know that I wasn't alone. Mm. And yeah. I think that's been the greatest strength for me to step out of victimhood, but also standing up to that voice in our head that tells us we aren't enough. Mine always told me I wasn't enough. And the evidence of your husband not only was cheating on you, but he was fighting for the other woman when he died. Those two things like created this wave of fear of, I need to prove to everyone that I'm enough. And so for a while, I just like bought into this voice and I would put on my high heels to go to the park because I didn't want anybody there to be like, oh, no wonder, no wonder, look at her. I would have cheated on her too. Mm -hmm. So that was like my motivating factor at first. And then, um, I realized that the voice wasn't my truth. And I started going, hold on, I hear you. I hear you saying that I'm a loser and I'm this and this and this, but I feel like there's, there's more to me than this. And, and starting to figure out which ones were the lies because I'm not going to live those anymore. And which are my truth? Who is Ashley? Who did Heavenly Father create her to be? And how are we going to find her again? And so then I just started almost like this bullheaded girl, like, no, I'm not, I'm not broken. And I'm going to prove to you why. And it wasn't to prove to anybody else. It was just really to help myself remember who I was because who I am is pretty amazing. Just like all of you. I love it. Oh, I love it that you were able to fight through that because it's just all of us have to deal with that to a certain extent, right? And, and it's whether we choose to listen to that or not. You know, totally. I'm sure you know, even before all this happened, like you said, it just reinforced some of those feelings that you had already had before. Sometimes we all have that feeling of being not enough. And if we start to listen to that, it, it'll grow. Whatever you, you feed grows, right? And so you start to, exactly. the more you listen to it, the deeper and deeper you can get into that hole. So I love that you stood up to it. And and again, back to the moments we stand, that's just so profound there that you were able to stand up to, to that voice. So talk to us about a little bit how your life has changed and how you've been able to stand again, what your life looks like now on the other side of this whole experience. Um, well, I am remarried, so that is amazing. Um, I have another daughter. He brought along a daughter. So we've got six kids and, and now our fight a lot of the times is just blending a family and we get to stand every day and choose each other, even when it's hard. And, um, let's see, I've written a couple books about our journey. I've, uh, created a conference called a reason to stand. And I, I bring in other presenters that share their survivor stories to help, to help others who are stuck in that victim mentality overcome and become the survivors that they were born to be. Um, and I like to go around. I, I can't say that I ever wanted to, to share my story in the first place, but especially not to get on a stage and open up the most humiliating parts of my life. But it has been the greatest blessing of my healing to stand on a stage and say, here, look, my life sucks too. And here's how I got out of it. And I hope that when you leave here, you're going to go home and fight for your truth because you're worth it. And it's been really, it's been really empowering for me, but I also 
love the fact that I started doing it because I hoped to save someone from having an affair and I hoped to save someone from taking a gun. Those were like my two goals. And now I don't even focus on what they shouldn't do because there's so much goodness that they are, that even if they've made mistakes or even if they aren't perfect, they are a value and they have worth. And that's the message that I really want to inspire people to believe and to remember. And that is such a powerful, powerful message. And I, I love when one of the favorite things for me about having people on the podcast is, you know, people have hard, hard things they've been through, but when you are able to bless others' lives because of that, it's just, it's amazing to see, you know, God working in your life and to pick you up from this place and say, okay, that was really hard, but now you're going to go make things a little less hard for someone else. And in the process, yeah. you'll continue to heal. It will continue to get better for you and it will get better for other people too. So I think it's awesome. The work that you're doing, uh, the things that you share and that you're willing to put it all out there and be, you know, so vulnerable and, and let yourself be seen. So tell people how they can um, get in touch with you, your books and your conference and your blog and all those good things. Okay. Um, the blog is themomentsbestand.com. Um, my conference website is a reason to stand.com. And the next one I have scheduled is in Provo, Utah on November 4th. So that's going to be awesome. Um, what else? I'm on Instagram, The Moments We Stand. Also, Facebook, I have The Moments We Stand page. Um, how else? Uh, there are real, like the story, the details of the story was on Dateline a few years back. Um, I went on the Dr. Phil show a couple years ago. I wouldn't necessarily recommend watching it, but... Um, what else? I think that's about it. Oh, my email, the moments we stand at gmail.com. And I love, I love to hear people's stories. I sometimes share highlight stories on my blog. So if you want to write it up, send it in. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Cool. All right. Well, I will link to all of those in the show notes. And I have appreciated so much just talking to you and learning from you and seeing this process of growth that you've been through, because I think that it's very inspiring and it's something that we can all learn from. And, you know, it's just, it's awesome to see how God has worked in your life and helped you to become even more. So thank you so much again for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you, you everyone for listening. Yeah. Thanks for being here on Moms Who Know. Subscribe to Moms Who Know so you never miss an episode and join the conversation on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Moms Who Know podcast.